to some people, and they said in the movies they had used people like Morris Evans and classical actors, Shakespearean mm -hmm. actors. And what they really wanted, since the main thing that projects is your voice, were people who could do Shakespeare and classical things. You know, you're behind these appliances, it's like a mask, it muffles everything, and you have to be able to project and project a kind of formal quality, you know, after all, the apes didn't talk like humans, you know, they're not colloquial or anything, very formal. And I talked to some people about it, and they thought it was fascinating. And as a matter of fact, when I did the thing, everybody in town wanted to be on the show. And the funny part is not only they wanted to be on it, they wanted to wear the makeup home. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw a lot of people around Los Angeles, a lot of apes driving cars, and they wanted to show it to their kids and whatnot. Anyway, I auditioned for it, and there were about 60 people there. Of all descriptions, mainly, I played Urko, the chief gorilla, chief of security. And he had to be strong and big. And those that were strong and big, I felt, were not such great actors. First of all, I didn't think I had a prayer to get the role. I just didn't feel I was right. Maybe, you know, there's something about me I don't know. And those that I felt were pretty good actors were just not physically right. So I read for it, and I got the part immediately, which was a surprise. And it was a very interesting adaptation. They said, well, forget about eating now. So when you put the stuff on, you can't chew things. It's hard to get them in your mouth anyway, because, you know, the appliance sticks out three or four inches from the front of your mouth. You have to put everything way back there. And you you need a long spoon, and when you chew it, the thing will come loose because it's put on with spirit gum. I found that they were wrong. They make appliances. They started a little factory there. They had a little factory right at 20th Century Fox, and different sculptors, men and women, came in and in clay designed the different characters, the chimpanzees, which is Roddy McDowell and several others, and the orangutans, which was Dr. Zayas, and the different gorillas so that each one was designed to be slightly different and have, you know, an individual character. And then they molded them, and they would turn this stuff out so that... I had one, anyway, that was molded in my face. They had to make a cast and everything. And every day that I came to work, I had a new one. It was kind of expensive. But anyway, when the thing fit so well, I found I could do all kinds of things with it. After all, it is really a piece of rubber, and... It has no life unless you bring it life, you know, your eyes, and you have to make faces like apes do, you know, and that kind of makes the thing come alive. And your eyes are very important. People who saw me on the show recognized my voice. They said they recognized my eyes, and they recognized me. I thought at first, you know, yeah, I'm playing an ape, and I told you I was a little bit insulted by it, just slightly. And afterwards, I kind of took it as a character role, really, with certain gorilla-like qualities. But he was a kind of a lusty, sort of hardy, you know, not completely, uh, a sort of devious fellow, you know, but in a kind of innocent way, full of good humor. It was a very dynamic role and became, really, what they said was the most dynamic role on the show. And... If it had gone on, they were planning all kinds of great things for it. And it was well, kind of a horror. It was very difficult. There was the heat under this makeup all day long. Putting on the makeup took three hours. We used to come in at five in the morning to start with it. And we did a lot of the shooting out in Malibu Canyon at the Fox Ranch. And since it was out of doors and it's in the canyon, you had to stop when the light goes, when the sun goes down. And winter was coming on. This was November. And the sun was going down earlier and earlier. So instead of starting at 5 with the makeup, they wanted to start at 4. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately or unfortunately, the show didn't go on. We did about 14 segments. It really didn't have the backing of CBS. It was a wonderful idea, and it's a pity that it just was thrown away and went down the drain. The movies had great ratings, and the television show was put on Friday night opposite the toughest competition there was at that time, 
which was Chico and the Man and Sanford and Son, and they would get 50% shares and we would get 28, 25, which would be fine nowadays. But then they expected more, and I think the head of CBS wasn't for the show. But if it had been very successful, they would have continued it. So it is a pity. ABC at the time talked about picking the show up, but they don't like to do that. They don't like to take the chance. Other networks don't like to take the show from a different network because they put themselves out on a limb, and if the show fails, they really look awful. If it succeeds, then, you know, they look like magicians, but if it fails, they look bad, and they're not willing to take the chance. So that good idea was thrown away. There were several of the segments that I thought were very good that investigated the history and the culture of the apes and the juxtaposition. Well, you know what science fiction is. The strength of science fiction is that you can make so many comments about life and all the cultures without getting yourself in trouble, you know. And one took place in the destroyed San Francisco subway, you know, where Urko, the girl who begins to discover something about his past. And that was one of my favorites.